All right, Genesis chapter 3, verse number 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them were both, uh, of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Father in heaven, we thank you again for the privilege of prayer that you might guide our hearts and direct us with the power of the Holy Spirit. Help us to say exactly what is pleasing to thee and nothing more. I pray that you prepare our hearts to receive God's word because obviously there is a necessity, a reason, a purpose this morning for this message. So I pray, Holy Spirit of God, that you start here in the pulpit and go all the way to the front doors that we might hear exactly what you are saying. Adam and Eve were able to hear your voice in the cool of the day in the garden. So, Father, how desperately today we would desire to worry, cause us to be uh, doubters, cause us to get distressed, and doing everything he can do. Because, listen, when we're not 100%, we start having problems. We start looking at sin maybe in a different fashion. Because it's real easy for people to literally condone sin by saying, well, you know, it's not that bad. Everybody's doing it. Well, I want to tell you this morning, everybody is not doing it. When we walk in Christ, we walk by choice. When we sin before God, we sin by choice. It's something that we've done without either thinking about it, without praying about it. But let me give you four thoughts this morning about what the seductiveness of sin does. And listen, if it didn't have a drawing effect, no one would ever have a problem. And listen, it's not only politicians that have problems lying. It's not only those that have a problem with stealing. There's people all over this world that are tempted in every form and fashion. And some of them, if they're not strong in their faith, they will literally fall into the condemnation of sin. Yes, even born-again Christians. When you got saved, he didn't say that you'd never sin again, but he said he was your advocate, which would be your go-between, that if we would repent, he would absolutely forgive us because that's how much he loves us. Number one, I'd like to tell you that sin, in the Garden of the Eden picture, sin has changed the status that they had into a stigma. Now think about the status they had. Walking with God in the cold of the day in an environment when it was absolutely perfect with the colors, with the smell, with the beauty. The very hand of God had made what we'd call a paradise. And one day that will be reinstituted in our world. And boy, I'm so looking forward to God doing and undoing what everything man has destroyed. So I want you to think about the status that they had and it changed into a stigma. That stigma was like their lives were so changed like they were branded. It's like they've been stained by the sin. It will never allow them to be the people that they were in the Garden of Eden because now they don't feel comfortable in the presence of God with no clothes on because see, while they were perfect, it was all pure and right in the mind and the heart of God so they didn't have any issues. But as soon as their eyes were open to their condition, they felt embarrassed. 
They felt ashamed. And the Bible said, we heard you coming and we hid. They didn't feel comfortable by standing in the presence of God. Now, the cause of the serpent's cure, look in verse 14, if you would, please. Verse 14, the Bible said, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Now, here's the cause. Because thou hast done this, what? Deceived Eve, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. You do something as in the form of getting rid of it. Not just saying shoo, shoo, shoo. I say shoo, shoo, pow, shoo, shoo, pow, and shoo, shoo, pow again. Because I understand they might come upon me and bite me in, a, in, a, in the heel or something like that. And then I might die with a heart attack, not because it's poisonous, but because I got snake bit. So the consequences of the serpent's cure was basically because he was the one who basically started all this in the motion. Now, wait a minute. Eve said in verse number three, she told him this, that the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it. God didn't say that. She also added to the word of God and said, lest ye die. That's not what God said. So it's so easy today while we have thousands of churches on every corner of every state around the world and people are understanding why do we have so many churches so many denominations it's simply because people are changing the word of god they're changing their beliefs they're changing their faith and they're trying to say what the world is saying why can't we all just get along well if my heart is different and i'm not the same person and you still are the same person, you've never been saved, you can understand why Amos would say, how can two walk together except they be agreed? We can't. Our likes are now different. Our, our ideas are different. So therefore, I cannot walk in the presence with a lot of people. I don't hardly go fishing with them. I don't do a lot of things of this world. Now, it would be good because Christ went to the sick, the dying, those that were leprosy, so he went to see a lot of people that needed him and people couldn't believe that he was absolutely going into the presence of these people. In Sunday school this morning, we talked about the woman of the well, how she was no doubt a Gentile. She was uh, dirty, not clean as far as the Jews were concerned. But Jesus on purpose went to Samaria and found her at the well of Jacob. Therefore, he had a message just for her and boy, when she heard the message, wow, she took off running, forgot her water pot, and supposedly went back into the city and said, come see a man that told me ever I, all I did. So what a blessing that was. But sin has had an effect in everybody's life. Some people say, well, you know, I had, I've met one young man that I worked with some years ago that actually told me, do you know, preacher, I've never sinned. And I said, uh, excuse me. He said, well, let me explain. I've never took a drink. I've never been to a bar. I have uh, never smoked a cigarette. I've never been out past my parents' curfew. I've never did anything wrong to get myself in trouble. And I said, so what are you saying? He said, well, it's just nice to know you're going to heaven and I said, and how are you going to heaven? He said, basically, I just told you. And I said, well, I wish I could say that about myself, but I was not near clean as you were, but you would have still went to the same hell that I was headed to because the Bible said, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, you didn't have anything to do with it. Our parents a long time ago put the sin nature in us, and every one of us have been sinning ever since. But what you do have to do is do something about changing your character. And the character can be absolutely changed because we have a sin nature that we cannot allow to take full control because it will take us down a path 
uh, further than we want to go and keep us longer than we want to stay. So number one, sin changes our status to stigma. Number two, sin changes serenity into a struggle. They had it made. You get to thinking sometimes people say, well, you know, if I just had more money, if I just had a better job, if I just had a better family, if I just had a better everything, I would be doing much better. The first couple had it made. They didn't need money, but they had more than what wealth could ever buy them. They were the leaders of the garden. They were the keepers of the garden. And they were able to do all things and have it made and eat all the wonderful fruit that little hearts could understand. And they were going to live forever. How much better can it get? And then the snake, the serpent, the liar, the deceiver came in and told the woman and often thought, how long did they have conversations before she absolutely decided to try something? Uh, I read one commentary where the guy said, which is no proof, that no doubt she probably picked it up, had her arm around it. They talked together. They had a lot of time where they built up a trust and faith in one another. And I'm thinking, well, I don't ever remember, remember reading any of that in my Bible. But if somebody wants to go that route, that's fine. I don't know if it was a one-time conversation or was it a period of time. Because sometimes it just takes one little seed of doubt to get you to thinking about something else. How many times did I used to hear my children say, uh, Dad, you tell us we can't do this, we can't do that. You know, all my friends are doing it. You ever heard that from your children? And I said, well, it's going to be different in our home. We're not all going to go along with it. Well, Dad, you just, you don't let us do anything. I said, I'm trying to keep you safe and from keeping getting in trouble. So sin changes the very serenity of the comfort of a lifestyle to something that made them fully struggle. Please look with me in verse 15. And verse 15 says, basically God talking to the, the serpent, I will put enmity between, thy, between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, when we think about the serenity versus the struggle, basically from here on out, life would be a full struggle. They would have to go out and absolutely have a guard at the gate. So they could not have uh, maybe even a peek back into what they used to have. So many people are trying to find today uh, where the Garden of Eden is. And I hear a lot of scholars that say they believe it's in Iraq. But wherever it is, they're not going to find it, and they're not getting in. And no doubt it's done been completely hidden by the hand of God. Listen, the perpetual part of this conflict was with Satan himself. Not one of the angels that fell, but with Satan himself. Because Jesus said, while he was talking to them, he said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Now, this is going to be forever. Now, listen. And between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, thank God, and thou shalt bruise his heel. When we think about this very thing, the enemy is always going to be an enemy. He's not ever going to be your friend. He's never going to be anything but cause you displeasure, heartache, brokenness, whether it's through your life, through your, you and your spouse, or through you and your kids, you and your job. He's going to try to have problems and destruction on every hand. Why? Because when things are having a struggle, when people are having hard times, a lot of times people give up on God because he doesn't answer immediately. And sometimes they be basically just give up and wonder, well, is it worth it trying our best to live for God? But I want to tell you, in the end, you'll be glad you did. Walk with God, live in the light, and be the light and the salt of the earth. The promise of the conquest of the Savior, listen, this is the beautiful part, that he would bruise his head, and thank God any time that there's a serpent on the ground, we can bruise that head. But I'm glad Jesus Christ, even in the garden, could absolutely take care of that now and forever. But listen, he's the very persecutor of the church. 
He's the very destructor of all things that are right, not only the church, but in the Christian life. He wants to destroy you at any cause. And listen, he knows he's got plenty of time, but he knows he's also got a short period of time because he don't know when the rapture is going to take place. And thank God we know that he's going to be put in his place. Now remember this. That hell was not made for you and I. Hell was absolutely made for the devil and his angels. So can I say, anybody that goes there, you're actually an uninvited guest. You're not welcome. But I hope and pray that in the period of time, men and women will not play religious games. They will not play church games. They will get birthed into the family of God. Trust the Lord Jesus Christ because, listen, it's his way or no way. A lot of people say, you Baptists think you're the only ones going. Well, I'll tell you the only ones going, everyone that's born again. I don't care what church denomination you hide on your back, but if you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior as the only way to get to heaven, you will be there, and I don't care what label you carry with you. Number one was sin changes of status to a stigma. Number two, sin can change serenity into a struggle, and it absolutely did, and it's been a struggle ever since. Number three, sin changes security into sorrow. They had eternal security in the beginning, and then they lost it because the Bible said they died and started dying, even though lived uh, 900 years but they started dying, started feeling pain and suffering. I know they did because I remember God said, I believe it was uh, verse 19, in the sweat of thy face, listen, shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken, for, that's the past, for dust thou art, that's the present, and unto dust thou shalt return, that's the future. So this is what the very one, one sin. I almost titled it this morning, What Can One Sin Do to Anybody? Because I remember as a young person, when I was offered something to drink, they said, one won't hurt you. And then somebody else said something else, well, just one won't hurt you. Just sneaking out from your parents' house one time won't hurt you. And it'd be my luck that the one time you get caught and then tell me how bad you get hurt. God has multiplied the woman's sorrow. So her security turned into sorrow. Please look with me in verse 16. Ladies, I feel so sorry for you for this curse. The Bible said, unto the woman, he said, I will, look at the word, greatly multiply thy sorrow uh, and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and the desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now you know where all that started, don't you? Now listen, I'm not against the women, but I am against these people that are trying to claim equality and equal rights. Do you know today that if I put a man and a woman here today, in front of everybody, do you think we can tell the difference? This is a man, this is a woman. She is different, he is different. He has things to do, she has things to do, but they're not equal. Now, I'm all for equal pay if you do the same job, but listen, God made us different. People don't like that today. I'm sorry, God made us that way, but to the woman, he said, I have a curse for you. Why? Because you listen to the deceiver. And she even said, now wait a minute. What, I believe it was verse number uh, verse number six. And the woman saw the tree. Right, I'll tell you what. Hold your place here in verse six. And then I want you to go to 1 John chapter number two. Let me read again verse six. And then I'm going to show you a comparison. The Bible said in verse 6 of Genesis chapter 3, while you're turning to 1 John chapter 2, and the woman saw the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree, watch this, to be desired to make one wise. 
Now, 1 John chapter number 2, verse number 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Do you see the three things that here affected her? She said it was good for food, pleasant to the eye, and desired to make one wise. She was attempted just like many others, but all she had to say was, God said we are not to eat of, not, not to touch it, but not to eat thereof. So he supplied absolute, the curse going to be in its fullest, and I'm not sure which was worse toward the woman or toward the man. I've never had a child, don't desire to know what it feels like to suffer of that nature, but I'm going to tell you something, it's times like then, when a lady is being delivered of a child, that she's more tougher than most men that I know, amen? I've met a couple of men that's had a kidney stone, and they thought they were dying. And you know what? They were. They were absolutely dying. I've had that to happen. Brother Mike, you could write us a story on kidney stones. But I can tell you this, that I've been in the floor screaming and crying like a baby on a little minute kidney stone. And I, saw, <laughs> I asked my wife one time, is this what it feels like to have a baby? She said, I don't know how bad you're hurt. And I said, I'm dying. She said, then that's what it feels like. Amen. But thank God there's a wonderful time after the birth of the baby. Then it turns from sorrow to rejoicing. God has mandated the woman to be under subjection. Now, in this day and time, that does not go over well in this society which we now live. Women have gotten to the place now. They don't want anybody telling them what to do. But wait a minute. I did not set this up. All I'm doing is reading the Word of God. And the last part of verse 16 said, And shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. That could be for a beautiful way of protection, keeping her safe. And I would hope that he would be there and give his life in a heartbeat uh, for her protection. And if he won't, we need to take him out back and give him an old-fashioned whooping. Same cha sin changes security into sorrow. It has been pain ever since they left the garden, and it will be pain until the rapture comes, and we will finally be free from the pain of this physical body. Lastly, the Bible tells us that sin changes his sanctuary into suffering. Look at verse number 17, if you would, please. The Bible said, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of of thy wife. I wonder how many men have ever had to listen to that. If you had have listened to me, amen, and has eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. And this is his part for the man. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. And in verse number 18, he said, Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. As I read earlier, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Let me give you three points about the poor man. Number one, he had disobedience to the very command of God was the cause of his curse. God told him to do what he was told to do. The first Adam listened to the wrong counsel. The foolish Adam left the wise counsel, which was God. And of course, the final Adam lost the world control. Remember, he's not controlling the garden anymore. He's thrown out and all he's controlling is what him and his wife and children to be. That's all there was. Now listen what he had. He not only named the animals, but he took care of all of them. He was the very leader and world controller, you might say, of the entire garden. Number two, his disorder of the creation is the curse. It said in verse 18, thorns and thistle. This is what changed creation. Shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. It's a really terrible that thorns and thistles today is the silent witness or the picture of man's disobedience. 
Thistles are also of a solid warning of man's depravity, that man cannot do any better except the work of his own hands. And then lastly, the death of the creature of God is the very conclusion of the matter. They started dying and brought death into the entire world, and we're looking at some 6,000 years that death has been reigning. And it will continue to reign until we get birthed into the family of God, and then death has no meaning to us. Listen, if you're born twice, you die once. If you're born once, you'll die twice. It's your choice. I just want to know that I'll never have to die in this life. And you say, but you might go to the graveyard. But it's not called death, it's called sleep. Because I will put the body to rest, and I will go into the presence of the Lord, and then I will live eternally until I come back and get the redeemed body. Adam is a reminder of his former days. Jesus told him, for out of the ground uh, thou wast taken. He was dust in the beginning. God put that body together, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Adam is also reminded of his present uh, facility. He said, for dust thou art. You are still that way, formed in a body, but you're still nothing but dust. And then Adam was reminded of his promised fate. Listen what it says, unto dust thou shalt return. What a shame and disgrace where one, one act of disobedience put all of humanity in degradation and disobedience to Almighty God. So can today one little old sin make a difference? And if it doesn't make a difference in your life, how is it making a difference in those that are watching you? I remember always trying to tell my kids, don't drink, don't do this, don't do that. And they, they've heard my testimony, Sister Lisa, where I was involved in drinking and drugs and everything that the world offered. And of course they said, but dad, you did it. And I said, yes, but dad was on his way to hell. And I found out the hard way what kind of life it will destroy. So I said, you can listen to me and probably find a lot of help from the suffering or you can try it and then find out for yourself. Listen, it's not always a good policy that experiences the best policy. That's not a good thing, amen? I don't have to go through the sufferings. I will listen to you that says, you know, if you stick a, a couple of screwdrivers into that outlet and hold on to it, preacher, it'll shock you. Well, you know what? I'm gonna believe you because I'm not gonna go over and find out if you're telling me the truth. And if you tell me that's a dangerous snake, don't pick him up. I will listen to you. Now, I might not have listened to you when I was five or ten years old, but I've learned a little bit about listening to people that can help us. But people in this day and time do not like to be told what to do. And I'm going to close with this. If you don't get birth into the family of God, I'm telling you, according to the Word of God, you will wake up in a devil's hell. And you won't like it. You will scream, you'll be tormented, you'll burn. I'm not sure if you're going to need a drop of water, but I know that it's going to be the most suffering in five minutes that you will have in eternity because it's all going to be the same. And here's what I will end this saying. You could have had it better. You could have trusted the Lord and say, what have I got to lose? I believe I'll trust you. We talked a little bit Wednesday night about deathbed experiences. Can people be saved? I believe if you will trust God, his love said, I will forgive you. I will write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. I will give you a whole new life. You will absolutely have eternal, everlasting life. And listen, you get to make the final choice. So that if you do not make it, when you look around at all of the thousands, millions in hell, you will never say, you caused me to be here. The things that you said, the things that you've done, because no one makes anyone do anything against their will. Jesus said he loved you, said he wants to be with you, said he wants to be in you, said he wants to give you a new life. And that's up to you and I to make those choices. Let's all stand to our feet with our heads bowed.
Heavenly Father, we've come before you this morning to thank you for the Word of God. Sin is a subject that is not a pleasing thing to talk about. But sin is what got us where we're at. We're in the place. We're born into this life, struggling, suffering, pain, sorrow. All the things that could possibly happen to the human life has happened because of sin. But dear God, thank you that you've already came and literally became the sin for us. He who knew no sin, but that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You took my place. You was able to set me free because of the faith that you gave me to believe in you, to trust you. And Father, now I know within my heart, I am your child of God. And if something happens within the next two seconds, I know comfortably where I will be in the presence of Almighty God. And that's because of you, your suffering at Calvary. Thank God for your third day resurrection and how you have came to give life to all. You said you're not willing that any should perish, but that all would come under repentance. Father in heaven, the world is turning hard, cold, and bitter. It's harder for people to repent because they feel like it takes away from their character. But, oh God, except we repent, we shall all likewise perish. God in heaven, speak to our hearts. Lead us by your Spirit. And please, oh God in heaven, convict us with Holy Ghost conviction that we might listen to you, follow you, and then be obedient. And say simply, Lord, here am I. Please save me. Please forgive me of my sins, and the best I know how I'm trusting you as my Lord and my Savior. God in heaven, help us to run to Jesus before it's eternally too late. Thank you for what you're going to do now in this invitation, and we'll thank you for all things that you do, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's do Just a closer walk with thee.